जय राधा माहवा कुंज विहा माधवा कुंज विहा जय गोपी जनवा गिरिवार जय गोपी जनवा गिरिवार जय सूर्यनंदन ब्रज झन यसौनंदन ब्रज झन जम्मून थीरा छी जम्मू न थीरा पान चाहरी जम हे झाय राधा कुंज बिहा रे जय हे धैय राधा कुंज जय गोपी जनवा गिरिवार गोपी जनवा गोपी जनवा गिरिवार सौरनंदन भज झन झसौरनंदन भज झन झाय जमून थीरा चाहरी जमून जमून थीरा चाहरी ये धैयु राधा कुंज बिहा राधा कुंज बिहा शिलोपाद की श्रीमद भगवथाम नास्त प्रायशु आप दृश्य नित्यम भागवत सेवा भक्तवि भक्ति उत्तम श्लोके भक्ति भावी नैस्ती की ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवा Oh everybody chant as loud as you can Om namo bhagavate vasudevaya Om namo bhagavate vasudevaya Om namo 
Bhagavate Vasudevaya Srimad Bhagavatam 8th Canto Chapter 15 Bali Maharaj Conquers the Heavenly Planets Text number 29 and through 31 Ojaswinam balim jetum Nasamarto stikaschana Bavad vidho bavan vapi Varja yet yeish Varja yet harim Ujashwinam balim jetum Nasamarto stikaschana Bavavido bavan vapi Varja yet vaisvaram harim Ujashwinam balim jetum Nasamartosti Kaschena Bava Vido Bavan Vapi Varja Yid Vaishwaram Harim Ladies. Ujaswinam, so powerful, Balim, Bali Maharaj, Chetum, to conquer, Na, not, Samarta, able, Asti, is, Kaschina, anyone, Bhavat Vida, like you, Bhavan, you yourself, Va Api, either, Varjad Hidva, accepting Ishwaram, the Supreme Controller, Harim, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. <laughs> Let's see. Vijesh Yati will conquer. Na, not. Ka, api. Anyone. Inam, him. Bali Maharaj. Brahma Tejas Sama Samaditam. Now empowered with Brahma Tejas, 
extraordinary spiritual power. <clears throat> Na, not, Asya, of him, Shakta, is able, Pura, in front, Statum, to stay, Pritam Antasya, of Yamaraj, Yata, as, Janaha, people. So, um, Brihaspati is instructing um, Indra. The Bali's about to attack the heavenly planets, and he's powerful. He's describing his power in this verse here. Translation, neither you nor your men can conquer the most powerful Bali. Indeed, no one but the Supreme Personality can conquer him, for he, now, for he is now equipped with the Supreme Spiritual Power, Brahmatejas. No one can stand before Yamaraj, no one can now stand before Bali Maharaj. Tasmanilayam utsrijya yuyam sarva trivishtapam yata kalam patikshanto yata satrar viparya yaha Therefore, waiting until the situation of your enemies is reversed, you should all leave this heavenly planet and go elsewhere where you will not be seen. Esha vipra balo darkam samprada yur jita vikramaha desha meva pa mane nam sanu sanu bando vinakshati. Translation, Bali Maharaj has now become extremely powerful because of the benedictions given him by the Brahmanas. But later he will insult the Brahmanas. He will be vanquished along with he, his friends and assistants. Hmm. Purport, Bali Maharaj and Indra were enemies. Therefore, when Brihaspati, the spiritual master of the demigods, predicted that Bali Maharaj would be vanquished, when he insulted the brahmanas by whose grace he had become so powerful, Bali Maharaj's enemies were naturally anxious to know when that opportune moment would come. To pacify King Indra, Brihaspati assured him that the time would certainly come, for Brihaspati could see that in the future Bali Maharaj would defy the orders of Sukracharya in order to pacify Lord Vishnu Vamanadeva. Of course, to advance in Krishna consciousness, one can take all risks. To please Vamana, Dave, Bali Maharaj risked to find the orders of his spiritual master, Sukracharya. Because of this, he would lose all his property, yet because of the devotional service to the Lord, he would get more than he expected, and in the future, in the eighth Manvantari, he would occupy the throne of Indra again. Hmm. Om Gyan Timiranda Syagina Jana Salakaya Chaksu Unmilitam Nina Tasmai Shri Gurvena Maha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Shri Makti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamane Namaste Sarasvari Devi Gaudavani Pacharine Nirsi Sasunyavari Pasyatyade Satarine Panchakalpa Taru Bhishya Kripa Sindhu Bhavacha Nitanam Bhavane Bhyo Vaishnave Bhyo Namaho Namaha Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Sivasari Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Ram Hare Ram 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 Hare so one becomes powerful by pleasing the great souls <laughs> because they have, they are connected with the source of power, the Supreme Lord Himself. So by pleasing the great souls, one receives their benedictions and blessings and one becomes powerful. <laughs> this is the situation with Bali Maharaj. He had pleased Sukaracharya. 
Sukracharya was his guru, although he was a seminal guru, still he was very powerful, as we heard from the previous verse. And Bali had attained that uh, that Shakti. Now he's going to attack the heavenly planets with his armies. The demigods are seeing Bali come, and he looks effulgent. And Ender inquires from Brihaspati, what is the situation with Bali? Before he was defeated, now he is coming back in such a powerful way. Well, then Brihaspati and enlightened Indra by explaining how he had received his power by pleasing his spiritual master. Uh, yasya prasada bhagavad prasada yasya prasadan nagati kutopi that by the grace of the spiritual master one gets the grace and mercy of Krishna and without the grace of the spiritual master, Nagati Gatopi, and it's all useless. <laughs> One's endeavors in spiritual life will not bring any result, any tangible result. And so one has to seek to please the spiritual master by pleasing the spiritual, uh, by, uh, one has to seek to please the Lord by pleasing the spiritual master. On how is the spiritual master pleased? We always say, well, he's pleased if you follow his instructions. And that's nice. But there's more to it than that. You have to be enthusiastic to follow. <laughs> Not just going through the motions. The enthusiasm is life of bhakti. Without enthusiasm, bhakti has no life. As Rupa Goswami says, Utsaha Nishaya Darya Tatat Karma Pavartana. That enthusiasm is the first principle in the execution of devotional service. So without being enthusiastic for the activities of devotional service, then we don't really benefit at all so much. I mean we if we're following but we're not enthusiastic, we get some benefit. But what is the enthusiasm? Rupa Goswami explains that that enthusiasm is to use your intelligence how to serve. <laughs> is to understand by intellectual understanding how best I can serve, how best I can execute these orders of the spiritual master. There are those who... There are three kinds of people. There's people who make things happen. There's people who watch things happening. And then there's others who wondered what happened. <laughs> Hare Krishna. <laughs> so we try to be the, the first one. We have to make things happen. <laughs> so, Or sometimes there's another group that Everything happens to them, but only when something happens to the, to them do they make th do they react. But devotees are thinking in a proactive way how to make things happen, how to increase the quality of my service, how to become more enthusiastic in our devotional service, how to learn how to know the scriptures better. In other words, there should be an active in intelligence in everything we do to keep our mind fixed in the whole process of devotional service. Because it's more than just carrying out instructions. It's carrying out instructions in such a way that we can do it in the best possible way. And we also think how to make it even better. There's three kinds of devotees. The first class, second class, and third class. We call them three kinds of disciples. Not devotees, three kinds of disciples. First class disciple knows what the spiritual master wants without even being told and can execute the service in that way. He's the most intelligent. He keeps, he observes his spiritual master very closely to learn 
the, the techniques of his spiritual master, how the spiritual master functions, what he likes, what he doesn't like, what he wants, what he doesn't do. He very carefully understands, and after understanding, he can do things with even without even asking. That's first class. The second class are those who are, when they're told what to do, they can do it. Mm -hmm. You tell them, okay, do this, all right, I'll, I can do it. That's second class. And that's usually where most devotees are, they're on the second class. And the third class is you tell them, and they walk away and they come back later and say, what did you say? <laughs> They can't figure it out. <laughs> Even if you tell them how to do it, they still can't get it. So uh, we want to be at least second class. If you try to be first class and you're not first class, you become third class. <laughs> In other words, if you try to be first class, you think you know what the spiritual wants, but if you're not correct, then you're third class. That means you're doing the wrong thing. So unless you're on the first class platform, you should not try to imitate that. <laughs> but second class is the safe. That one, one receives the instructions, one carries it out like that. And tries to carry it out in the best possible way. And that, that will please the spiritual master. Like that. So Bali, he was very... Uh, enthusiastic to please his spiritual master. But later on you'll see when the Supreme Personality of Godhead comes, Bali's caught between two uh, decisions. His spiritual master wants him to act in a certain way and the Lord wants him to act in another way. Now, usually the spiritual master is always in line with the Lord, and, and therefore there's no difficulty. But in this case, Sukracharya went against the Lord and was trying to encourage his disciple, Bali Maharaj, to follow him rather than following the Lord. Bali couldn't do that, and therefore he became glorious. He, and that'll come up as we read, and it gets really good. This is one of the most interesting pastimes. It's a very long pastime. It covers the rest of the whole eighth canto, except for the last chapter. Yeah. So it's a very interesting pastime. So here, what we can learn from these, uh, this particular thing is, Yasya prashada bhagavat prashadam yasya prashadam nagati kutopi. Try to always please the spiritual master or the re those who are representing the spiritual master. Just like the temple presidents or the authorities that have been given responsibility within the yatra, within the temple. They are also extensions of the temple president. I mean, I'm sorry, they're also extensions of the spiritual master. So when we follow their instructions, we're also, because the spiritual master wants, to, wants you to engage in devotional service, and then many times you work under the control or under the guidance of the temple authorities. So he, that temple authority becomes a representative of the spiritual master. So when we follow them, we're following the spiritual master. Same thing, like that. There's no difference. One, two plus two is four, three plus one, three plus one is four. So you might say, well, two plus two I can understand is four, but three plus one, it's a little, there's different numbers there. How could it be the same result? But it is. So we have to see things in relationship to how, what pleases Krishna by, by pleasing the spiritual master. And you see how powerful Bali became, you know, before he was defeated. In fact, he was on the verge of death. They took him to one mountain and revived him and got him back to life again. And then because he, he pleased his spiritual master right after that, 
then he got everything he needed and more like that. And Sukracharya was, I mean, from a uh, spiritual point of view, he was powerful in that way, but still he was a seminal guru. In other words, he, he was a family guru. He was not in, yeah, he was also in line, but at the same time, he had, uh, in other words, he was also be becoming a guru in order to get some monetary gain. In other words, when his monetary uh, franchise was disturbed, he was. that's when he went against the Lord. So although he was a, a powerful spiritual master, he did still have, he wasn't a pure devotee. Mm -hmm. So here, Prabhupada says, to advance in Krishna consciousness, one has to take all risks. Mm -hmm. So he's referring to Vamanadev and when Bali defied the orders of his spiritual master in order to follow the orders of Vamanadev, he took a risk. And you'll see what happened after. The risk, apparently, initially, not a, not a, initially, kind of was something that apparently gave, put him in an awkward situation. Even the Lord even punished him. But eventually, because he was humble, he actually uh, pleased the Lord, and the Lord became... Uh, Klein to offer personal service to Bali Maharaj. That's a very amazing pastime. So one has to take all risks for the Lord. Sometimes Prabhupada said that. Prabhupada says that in the Krishna in his lectures, one should take a risk for Krishna. <laughs> but then he says that risk shouldn't be at the expense of losing your Krishna consciousness. You take a risk, you go out and preach, you go out and distribute some books, or you, what else do you do? You might decide to go somewhere and open up a preaching center. You know, you know, go, go somewhere and open up a preaching center, start a nice preaching center, and then pretty soon people will come, and then, you're actually spreading Krishna consciousness. So you took a little risk, you depend on Krishna, and Krishna will send after some time. So devotees have done that, gone to different places in the world and just started to preach when there was not, nothing going on there. And after some time, something happens. <laughs> you sit down with a pair of cartels in the public area and you start chanting, distributing a little bit of Prashadam and some flyers, and you invite people to come to a program, and you organize. And then pretty soon, you have some followers. Then after it gets bigger and bigger, some of the followers become your assistants. And then after some time, you have a, uh, a reason to get a preaching center. Happens all the time. Devotees have done that. So that's a nice risk to take. Go somewhere and just start preaching. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so those who have got that ability, who can lead kirtan, who know the philosophy a little bit, can do that. Of course, anybody can sing kirtan, but that's nice. So take a risk for Krishna. Prabhupada took a risk. He had no money. He had no contacts, one small little contact in America. He was 70 years old. He took a huge risk and came all by himself on a boat for 39 days without any support, without any, without any, nothing. <laughs> it was just the only, only thing he had was the order of his spiritual master. But then, if he didn't take that risk, we wouldn't be sitting here today, <laughs> that's for sure. And he's, because he took that risk, Krishna consciousness spread around the world. Prabhupada liked that. 
there are devotees in our movement who like to take risks because what it does, it just shows how, how merciful Krishna is. When you take a risk for Krishna, you see how Krishna comes through and he usually facilitates what you're trying to do. Of course, you should get approval before you take your risk, but why not take a risk? <laughs> Yeah. Okay. How many are going to take a risk? <laughs> Little one. <laughs> okay. Sisi Pancha Tattva Ki Jai. It makes the Krishna consciousness exciting. <laughs> and that's. Otherwise, after a while, if, it, if you don't become excited about Krishna consciousness, you, you wind up leaving. <laughs> You have to get excited. It's really an exciting process. So taking risks like that. Prabhupada was describing when he was small how they were building a building. And you know, if you've been to India, you know how they, how they construct buildings. They put all these bamboo poles together and they tie them. And they make this like scaffolding all around the building with these bamboo poles. It's not like the modern day <laughs> stuff with the cranes and all that. And people climb up them, you know. So Prabhupada said, when I was small, they were building, they were talking about one building. Prabhupada said, yeah, I climbed to the top of that building. <laughs> and, and the devotee said, oh, Prabhupada, you were very brave. Prabhupada said, yes, otherwise, how could I come here? <laughs> Meaning, how could I come to? The West. <laughs> I'm still brave. Yeah, he said that. <laughs> yeah, you heard that lecture, right? Yeah, he said, I'm still brave. <laughs> yeah, it, so yeah, that would take a chance for Krishna and then just depend on Krishna's mercy. But it should be something in line with Krishna consciousness, not, not something that's outside of Krishna consciousness. Then you don't get the mercy. Okay, so let's see what else we got in this verse here. Yeah, and Brihaspati is assuring Indra that don't worry, you'll get your kingdom back and you'll be victorious, but right now is not the time. So this is another interesting point. When you want to do something, the best thing to under one of the most important thing to understand is when's the best time to do it. It's called acting timely. You might, be, you might be thinking in the right way that this is the thing you want to do, but is this the best time to do it? That's also a very subtle but very important point, is to understand uh, things are favorable or unfavorable according to you know, the time, place, and circumstance. Like that. Just like somebody wants to get married, but it's not the time. But if they're in a rush to get married, and, and then they may choose the wrong person, and then everything is lost. That's just an example. Um, or I want to buy something, but maybe this is not the time to buy it. <laughs> maybe I should wait. Just like, here's one, you like this one. It says, in, it says, if you're thinking about eating or not eating, if you're unsure, should I eat or don't eat? The answer is don't eat, if you're unsure. But it says, in the month of December, you can eat. <laughs> so you still have another week to go. <laughs> So if you have a, a dis, an, an, if you're not sure whether to eat or not eat in December, of course it says if you're not sure whether to eat or not eat, don't eat. As soon as that doubt comes, it means no. But in December, you can eat. <laughs> anyway. 
That's Prabhupada's also. You heard that statement too, right? No? It's on Prabhupada's lecture. So, you know, there's a lot of subtle things that connect with the material energy, how it works, that can make our devotional service successful or make it more difficult. Devotional service is always successful, but when you know the subtle, subtle things, just like what are some of the subtle things we should know? When to pick? When to pay your obeisances, who to pay your obeisances to. Um, what is the best time for chanting your rounds? All these are subtle things, just like and then we say, well, you can chant 16 rounds a day. That's nice, but the best time is Brahma Mahorta hour. That's an example. Just like if you wake up really early before 2 o'clock, don't bathe. If you bathe before 2 o'clock in the morning, it's inauspicious. <laughs> because the mode of ignorance is still prominent up until 2 o'clock. But from 2 o'clock on, you can, then you can bathe. You know, all these subtle little things. There's a there's a whole book somebody wrote about the different omens too. Just like if you're about to go on a trip and you feel the, the left side of your face shaking, that means something bad is going to happen. So don't go. Or they say here, here's an example. Say, you, say you're... Uh, you're going out on book distribution. So you leave the temple, but you forgot something, and you're already on your way. So you need to go, you want to go back. So it says if you go back, it makes everything inauspicious. Once you leave a place, you should never go back to a place. That's inauspicious. So sometimes, just like ha happens to me once in a while, my driver forgets something and he has to go back. So I tell them, you don't go all the way back, you go almost all the way back. And then you get out of the car, walk to the place, and get where you can, and then come back. One time I forgot my deity, and I was on my way to the airport, and I thought, if I go back, it'd be inauspicious. So I, I didn't go back, and they mailed the deity to me, so. <laughs> So yeah, that's these are these are little subtle things that are part of the you know there's a whole series that's mentioned in the, the Krishna book. If you see somebody carrying a bucket filled with with something, that's auspicious. If you see somebody carrying an empty bucket, that's inauspicious. If you see deer. Passing on your right side, that's auspicious. Mm -hmm. I mean, something good is happening. So there's a whole series of what we say, it's signs in nature. It's, it's always be careful, observe how the material energy is working. Because sometimes Krishna will tell you, by the material energy, something's going to happen. And you can avoid that, that there might be something inauspicious. So one who knows these subtle omens and like that. Because it, it, those who really are expert at that, they can just see the material energy and they can tell you what's going to happen next. Just by looking at how the material energy is working like that. This is how prophecy works. You know, people who are prophets, Uh, prophecy works by studying the present and looking at the past, studying the past, looking at the present, and by combining these two into a, a study, one can understand what's going to happen in the future. Study the past, observe carefully the present, and one can understand what's going to happen in the future. Mm -hmm.
Just like they say, the best prophet is a false prophet. He sees, oh, people are acting in this way, and this is what's happening now. So he warns them, change. And so when they change, then it doesn't happen, the inauspicious things. Just like Prabhupada was saying, cow killing causes wars, pestilence, diseases in the world. Go, oh, so will you see. We have this epidemic, pandemic, and what is it? Cow killing. People are sinful. But people don't learn. They don't learn. But we know because Krishna explains these things to us. And people will think, people say, well, soon this pandemic will be over and everything will be. No, because people are still killing cows, they're still killing babies. So it'll continue. As long as they continue, everything, people, people want to be happy, but they don't know how to live. Therefore, how can they be happy? I can do anything I want and be happy. No, you can't. You have to follow the laws of God and the laws of nature, which are the laws of God also. Like that. Just like if you, you might like to eat something that's nice. But if you eat too much, then you might have to fast the next day. <laughs> so the laws of, laws of nature are very powerful, and they're also very subtle, too. The subtle ones you can't see. <laughs> Just like the ones we know. You look up in the sky, and you see black clouds coming. And you know it's going to rain, right? <laughs> So the sign, the sign comes in the sky with the clouds. Mm -hmm. We get the, we get this visible stuff, but there's so many other things, like that. But Krishna warns you what will happen or what will not happen if you are very connected to Krishna by remembering Krishna. Krishna is always telling you what to do, what to, to be careful, not to go here, to go, don't do this, do this, like that. That's Krishna. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, we'll stop here. Any questions? Comments? Oh. Uh, thank you, Guru Maharaj, for this lecture. Uh, my question is, Shukracharya was a very powerful guru and gave so many blessings and benedictions to his disciple. How did he acquire those powers? What was the process? Because he was not a devotee, so what was... Uh, I have to read the, read the life of Shukracharya. If you read the life of Shukracharya, you'll find out. I have it in a book. Um, I was reading it. He's, he did so many things in the past to attain his position. But I forgot. I read it a few years ago, so I kind of lost memory. Thank you. Yeah. His previous activities gave him his present situation. And his present activities will give him his future situation. And so we hear what happened to Bali Maharaj because Vaman Dev comes, asks for those three paces of land, and then he loses everything. But what happens to Shukracharya for misleading his disciple? We don't hear anything of Shukracharya after that. Well, when you see, he comes up again in the ninth canto. <laughs> Sukacharya's daughter, was it Sarmistra, married King Yayati, and that was a whole fiasco. <laughs> mm. 
Devayani and Sarmistra. One Brahmin wife and one Kshatriya wife. The Brahmin wife was the daughter of Sukracharya. I think that was Devayani. Yeah, Sharmishta was the princess. Mm -hmm. And Devayani was Sukracharya's daughter. Devayani was Sukracharya's mm. daughter. She was Bra <laughs> she was Brahmin. Sarmista threw her in the well. <laughs> they were fighting. When you get into the ninth canto, this is the, the most wildest things happen in that canto. It's like, whoa. <laughs> Those of you who like, you know, far out stories, ninth canto is, is the place. <laughs> whoa. Okay, anything else? Any other questions, comments? We got we got a question from... Uh, Hare Krishna, thank you for a lecture. Uh, only ask, uh, this you uh, mentioned, this nature law, something, it's uh, somewhere written down many of these, uh, um, these cases. Hmm? Ah. What, what was the question? I missed it. Yeah, where, uh, when, uh, where uh, exactly was written these uh, nature laws, these uh, cases, these examples? I can't understand. I can't understand what you're saying. If there is some book of these omens, how to? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I have it. But it's in the it's in the it's in the Krishna book too. There's a lot. There's in the Bhagavatam. It's also mentioned. Prabhupada's lectures. He talks a lot about these things. Mm -hmm. But I have the one. I have one book that one devotee made called Omens. Mm -hmm. It's an e-book, so I can send it to you. Thank you. <coughs> But don't get caught up in this stuff. It's you know, it's not directly Krishna consciousness. <laughs> oh, well, I think maybe help me. <laughs> this this uh, will help me because I often go and something forget and have a return, and now I have to be. Yeah, just meditation. like Nanda Maharaj and some of the cowherd boys, they bathe too early in the morning. So one of the servants of. Uh, Varuna came and captured him, brought him to Varuna for for punishment. Mm -hmm. That's when Krishna came back and had to rescue his father from Varuna. Mm -hmm. But he bathed too early. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was an inauspicious time. Mm Hare Krishna, question from Vallabhi. Hare Krishna Maharaj, addictions throws off the intelligence. So is it possible to be enthusiastic when you have an addiction? And are there addictions in passion and goodness or only in ignorance? Addiction? Is that the word? Addictions, yes. Can it be? Can it be? Can you be enthusiastic when you have uh, addictions? What does, she, what does she mean by addictions? I'm not sure. She's not specific, but she's asking: um, Are there addictions in passion and goodness, or only in ignorance? Addiction means you're really attached to something, but it usually has a, con a negative connotation. Generally, so she's asking whether it can. It's all in all three modes. Yeah, it's in all. Yeah, there's there's addictions in all the three modes. Yeah. And is it possible to be enthusiastic when you have an addiction? Uh, well, you can be, but you'll see that. That is a hindrance, and you have to work on that. 
So you can still be enthusiasm, enthusiastic, because enthusiasm is the nature of the soul's relationship with Krishna. Yeah, you can still be enthusiastic. But your, these addictions might come up from time to time and make what they call dampen your enthusiasm or water it down. <laughs> that can happen also. That will happen, yeah. But still, they can be enthusiastic. But we should try to avoid those addictions and replace them with what we say attachments to Krishna. Prabhupada said, all right, you're addicted to hearing Beatles sing songs, so why don't you hear Krishna conscious bhajans instead? You're in, addicted to eating the wrong stuff, then you eat prasadam. You're addicted to associating with certain people who are not good association, but change your association. So just the addictions are more like fixed habits. And then you have to break that habit with a new habit, with a better habit. Replacing one habit with another habit. But old habits and old addictions don't go away right away. They take some time. Mm -hmm. I'm addicted. Uh, someone say, "Well, I'm addicted to spacing out." So, <laughs> in other words, you just let your mind go wherever you want it to go. So, just then, just become addicted to chanting, and that way. Wherever you are, you're chanting the holy name, and you're not spacing out anymore. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, Guru Maharaj, during the course of the lecture, you said at one point, the best prophet is a false prophet. I'm a little puzzled by that choice of words. Could you explain that? Yeah. Something is about to happen, the prophet warns you that because this is what's going to happen because uh, this is the way things are going. People change their ways because of the advice of the prophet and it doesn't happen, false prophet. Ah, okay, <laughs> thank you. That's from a prophecy book. I just, I didn't make that up. <laughs> I'll take that false prophet anytime. <laughs> yeah, we could say that Looking at the world situation, if it continues on this way, this thing, these things will happen. Every, people, but if people change, then it doesn't happen. Mm. So he he advises you that this is this is going to happen. So change. Mm. And people wake up and change, and it doesn't happen. False prophet. Mm. Mm. Thank you very much. Mm. It's kind of a loose definition, but it's there. <laughs> okay, anything else? Thank you. Srimad Bhagavatam ki jai, Srila Prabhupada ki jai. Samabeda Bhaktivinda ki jai. <laughs>